Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and welcome to this joint uh, DCMI ACIST webinar. I'm Tom Baker, a member of the DCMI Directorate. Uh, this webinar is one of a series of joint DCMI ACIST webinars, which are presented as a service to members of DCMI and of ACIST and to other interested members of the public. The purpose of the joint series is to advance the discourse and practices of innovative metadata. Um, so after at, um, our speaker today is Asma Swaminan. Asma works as a, an information system specialist at the National Library of Finland, primarily on publishing bibliographic data, linked data, the SORI and ontologies, and he leads the development of the Scosmos uh, vocabulary browser software that is used in the Finnish National Ontology Service. Um, so before passing the microphone over to Asma, um, I wanted to point out that you will have an opportunity to ask uh, questions near the close of the webinar. There's a panel on the right of your screen uh, where you can enter the text of your questions. We ask that you wait to enter your text until near the end of the webinar because sometimes um, sometimes the questions are answered um, in the presentation itself. Um, and um, I will moderate the questions and answers uh, at the end and we'll get through as many as time our time allows. Um, so um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to pass the microphone over to Asma. Hello everybody, I'm Osma and yeah, I will speak today about, about bibliographic data models. My headline is From Mark Silos to Linked Data Silos. And um, this uh, webinar presentation is um, an extended version of a talk I gave uh, at the, the SWIP conference last November, and, um, and which had the same headline. So, so um, people requested me to, to make a longer in-depth version of that talk, so this, this is it. Okay, so uh, first to get started, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm uh, working at the National Library of Finland, and we're the oldest and largest scholarly library in Finland, and uh, you could say that we started in 1640 when the Academy of Turku was founded and it had a library, but of course it was very small at that time. And we are responsible for uh, collecting and uh, describing and preserving all the Finnish printed material and uh, also nowadays, of course, electronic material and digitized material. And we have many unique collections uh, in our, in our, um, yeah, uh, in our collection because, um, because uh, of the uh, shared history, first with Finland being part of Sweden and then later uh, part of Russia and, and lots of uh, collections dating from those periods. About myself, yeah, I work as an information system specialist um, and um, I did my PhD uh, at the Semantic Computing Research Group, uh, uh, finished in 2013. My topic was methods for building semantic portals. So I'm originally uh, a, more of a semantic web person than a library person, but I joined the National Library in 2013, the same year. And, uh, I, and my first task was, together with a team, to set up the Finto Thesaurus and Ontology Service. And I'm currently, my main project is, is uh, to open up bibliographic metadata as linked data. And I've been involved in, in, in open source software projects, for example, Scosify is, is a tool that I made as part of my PhD work uh, for uh, validate, validating and improving, uh, fixing SCOS vocabularies like thesauri and classifications, and then the Scosmos uh, publishing tool, which is the sort of the core of the Finto service. And I'm uh, also a member of DCMI governing board and, um, and in the SWIP program committee and some other yeah, activities. And there are some of my social media uh, links on the left. Uh, and my uh, talk today has two parts. The first part is uh, a general overview of uh, current uh, modern data models for bibliographic data. Uh, and, and the second part is, is more specific to my, my current work. It's about how we are 
uh, planning to publish Finnish bibliographic data as linked open data. Uh, so, as an introductory picture, this is how the uh, metadata of most libraries uh, looks like today, I think. So, uh, everything is based on MARC records and, uh, and they are sort of uh, captive in, in various uh, library systems, which are, so they are basically siloed. They might have an OPAC on the web. Uh, but the, the data is, is usually not available. And, uh, and uh, inside they look pretty much the same from a data model perspective. So there's bibliographic records, there's uh, authority records, and uh, m the, the cataloging rules are, well, not exactly the same, but, but still very similar. So, so this is the, the sort of uh, the old world, and now uh, the question is, what's what's going to happen next? So this is the first part about uh, what's going to come next after the MARP silos. Um, but first, um, um, a word about terminology. So when I speak about data models, I mean things like schemas, vocabularies, the, the kind of vocabularies that consist of classes and properties, like Dublin Core. And also ontologies and, uh, and application profiles are a special kind of data model that tries to reuse other people's uh, schemas or vocabularies, whatever. So these are all data models to me. I'm taking sort of a big picture perspective. Um, so I wanted to do a, a family tree of, of, of these data models, but there is no common ancestor, so it turned into a family forest. So um, I'm trying to put everything on in, in a single picture, and this is uh, quite a challenge, but let's see how I succeed. So I have, um, so I'm looking at, at these data models, but also conversion tools that can convert between, usually between MARC and the new model, and then um, also some application profiles and, and, and existing published uh, linked data sets. So, um, um, the, the one important dimension here for the data models is whether they are based on, on, on a flat model with records that sort of lump everything into a single package. These are at the top of the picture. And then the, 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 the more entity-based models that have a separation between, for example, uh, the Ferber model has works, expressions, and manifestations. Um, so these are at the bottom. And there is a, a, a thin line here in, around the middle uh, separating those models that don't have a, a special uh, entity type for work, and, and the, the bottom ones do have a, a special, uh, so they model work separately from, from other. Uh, kinds of entities. And there's also a legend to, to make sense of the, the colors. Um, so let's start with the, with the flat models here. So um, first of all, there's MARC, obviously. Uh, MARC is not an RDF data model. Uh, it's much older, obviously. And, uh, but there, is an, there have been a few attempts to, to create an RDF representation of MARC. It's generally difficult because there's an um, impedance mismatch between the MARC record structure and, and RDF. For example, a MARC um, order may be significant and uh, also the, the subfields are usually used in, in combinations, so it's not the specific subfield necessarily that's, um, that has to be represented but by the combination of those. So, but for example, MARC 21 RDF is, is one, one uh, RDF representation of MARC that has been proposed. Then there's MODS, which is an XML-based model defined by the Library of Congress, which can represent bibliographic data, uh, pretty much the same things as a MARC record, maybe not as detailed uh, in all cases, but uh, covers most of it. And then there is an RDF version of that called MODS RDF, also defined by the Library of Congress. And there is a conversion tool called MARC MODS to RDF, which can go from MARC to MODS and then to MODS RDF. Uh, then the sort of the other family 
tree is, is here is, is Dublin Core, which is a general, general model for metadata on the web. Um, the older DC elements and the newer DC terms are both here in this sort of represented as the same bubble. There's the Dublin Core uh, DC RDF representation, which is sort of the official way to represent Dublin Core using RDF. And then there is a tool, um, sort of a Swiss army knife for, um, for bibliographic and other data called Kathmandu, which can, among many other things, be used for converting from MARC to Dublin Core RDF. There have been some recipes published especially for this use case. Then there is the bibliographic ontology BIBO, which is uh, also a flat model uh, and it's, it's oriented around uh, scientific publications. So it's sort of a special domain, but it's, it's also for representing bibliographic data as RDF. Okay, then there is, uh, right here in the middle is kind of a special case, it's the schema.org. Uh, uh, it's a um, data model defined by the major browser went vendors a few years back and uh, it can be used to, to describe many other, m many things on the web, many kinds of structured data but also including bibliographic data, like creative works and books and uh, videos, movies, DVDs, people, organizations and things like this. And there is an um, extension, uh, the bibliographic extensions of schema.org that sort of bring it um, uh, towards an entity-based model, so it can actually be used either as a flat model, uh, a simple flat model similar to Dublin Core, or it can be used as uh, also a more detailed entity-based model where you bring out the works as a separate uh, separate entities and link link between them. Okay, then we get to the BibFrame family. So BibFrame 1.0 is already a little old, um, but it's um, it's an RDF model for representing mostly the same kind of data that's, that's represented in MARC, but remodeled in RDF. And, um, and what happened with BibFrame was that uh, it sort of split off into different, uh, uh, different variants. There's the original BibFrame 1, uh, defined by the Library of Congress, uh, together with Zephira, uh, and then the Library of Congress also made a um, conversion tool called Mark to BibFrame that can be used to convert from Mark XML to BibFrame. Uh, but then Zephira went off on their own and, and um, defined their own BibFrame flavor uh, called also BibFrame or BibFrame Lite and some extensions or, or, or BibFrame.me after the um, website where it's published. So it's, 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 it has to basically the same structure, but it's a different, um, from an RDF perspective, it's still a different data model, uses different URIs. And they have, Zephira has also published a, a conversion tool called PyBibFrame. Uh, yeah. uh, then uh, the Link Data for Libraries project uh, wanted to represent the library data from, from those university libraries that participated in the project and they took BibFrame, BibFrame 1 as a starting point but they were not happy with all of the modeling choices there so they uh, took out some parts and replaced them with other parts from other data models including some parts from schema.org and so they defined their own ontology called uh, LDA4L ontology uh, so, so this is sort of a flavor of BibFrame as well. Then there's BibFrame 2, which is uh, less than a year old, came out last spring. Uh, so it had many improvements and, and adjustments to the original BibFrame. Um, it's still fairly new, so uh, no um, conversion tools have been published yet. But then there's also the Link Data for Production and Link Data for Libraries Labs projects, which are successors to the Link Data for Libraries project, and they are uh, they have again taken the BibFrame 2 as a starting point for their new project, uh, but making adjustments as uh, as they um, uh, as they think is necessary. So they they are creating again their own own flavor of that. Um, I call it LDA4P ontology here, but 
it might also be like LD4L ontology version 2 or something. Okay, uh, then we get to the Ferber family, which is the, sort of the most entity-based of, of these um, families. Uh, Ferber itself is very abstract. It's not RDF-based in, in a way because it's it's more abstract than that. But there have been several uh, RDF-based data models uh, based on Ferber. Uh, first of all, there's Fabio, which is um, the Ferber-aligned bibliographic ontology. It's um, it's similar in scope to Bibo. It's targeting academic uh, scholarly publishing, but it's it's um, um, organized around the Ferber works, expressions, manifestations. Uh, then there's Ferber Core, which was an early RDF uh, representation of Ferber. Then there's uh, Ferber ER, which was sort of, um, I think, the most official RDF representation of Ferber because it was uh, defined by the, by the same people who, who created Ferber, basically. Uh, then there's uh, Ferber OO, the object-oriented version, which was sort of um, derivative of Ferber ER, but combining it with uh, the CDOC CRM conceptual model uh, for cultural heritage. So it sort of remodeled Ferber in a way that was compatible with the CDOC CRM thinking. And, uh, and then finally there is the E Ferber OO, the Erlangen version of Ferber OO, which was an, the Ferber OO itself was an RDF schema, but eFerber OO is an OOL ontology, so it's, it's sort of a more, uh, more detailed, has more, um, more sophisticated, in a way, um, a version of, of Ferber OO. And then there is um, the, uh, Aliada, which is, is, um, is a tool for uh, converting uh, interlinking, enriching, and publishing uh, bibliographic and also you know, some other data. Um, and it sort of uses eFerber OO as its native output format. So, so Aliada is, is uh, able to ingest mark records and then convert them into eFerber OO. Okay, then uh, the other branch here is, is RDA. RDA itself is more of a, of course, more of a set of cataloging rules, but the RDA vocabulary is, is sort of a, an appendix to that. It's, it's a data model. Uh, consists of many small value vocabularies, but also the overall model, which has classes and properties, which is uh, very much based on, on the Ferber, Ferber model. So it also has words, expressions, manifestations, and then all those properties um, for, for these entities. Uh, the Spanish National Library wanted to publish their um, bibliographic metadata uh, following uh, RDA, but if, instead of using the RDA vocabulary directly, they, they defined their own ontology because they wanted some local control, for example, over the labels, all the linguistic aspects of, of, of the model. So they defined the BNE ontology and used that for their data, and uh, the, they use the conversion tool called Marimba to, to convert from Mark to, to the BNE ontology. Okay. Uh, finally, there's been a number a number of libraries have uh, published um, linked data uh, based on their bibliographic records, and um, and many of them chose to to create an application profile. So they sort of reuse um, established vocabularies, but define uh, their own local rules and sometimes also local extensions. So the Japanese National Di uh, Diet Library, um, they, they, they defined an application profile that reuses Dublin Core, call it the DC, they call it the DCNDL application profile, and, and they published their bibliographic data the National Diet Library dataset using this application profile. Uh, similarly, the British uh, Library pub wanted to publish the British National Bibliography, so they defined an application profile that reuses Dublin Core, Bebo, but also many other uh, uh, RDF vocabularies. 
and they published the British National Bibliography as linked data using this AP. Then the, the, the German National Library also defined an application profile. They use uh, Dublin Core, Bebo, and uh, some parts of the RDA vocabularies in their profile, and they use it to publish their linked data. And they use uh, a conversion tool called Metafacture to, for the actual conversion process. Uh, the Swiss uh, uh, consortium of libraries, Swisslib, uh, has also defined a very similar application profile to the German one, and uh, and they use it in their uh, currently a prototype but in their linked data, and they also use Metafacture. But these th these four that I mentioned here are all all flat models. They um, they are basically just representing the, the mark records uh, in a different way, but they are not, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, representing works as, as separate entities. But then there's the, the, the French National Library, uh, who also, also defined an application profile partially based on Dublin Core and the RDA vocabularies and some others, and, um, and they do represent works. Uh, uh, and so they are they are more uh, sort of Ferber oriented than the others here, uh, except for the Spanish National Library as well. So so their data set also has a, a, has works as a separate entities. Then a few others here. There's uh, WorldCat by OCLC, the the largest Union catalog, I think, and they they it has been published as linked data for some years now, and um, and um, and a few years back, they also uh, created the WorldCat Works, uh, which is sort of an additional layer, a clustering of of these uh, records based on works. So, and they use schema.org as their data model, and and also the bibliographic extensions for to model the works. Then the LDA for L project has published some data sets using their ontology. Uh, Zephira has. Um, uh, is involved in an initiative called LibHub, where they they publish um, uh, bibliographic data using their model. And the Spanish National Library has their data set using the BNE ontology. And then the Aliada project partners. It was created by an EU project with participants from many countries. So many of them have also been published using the eFerbero uh, model. For example, Artium is, an, is a Basque museum. Okay, so here's all the data models in one picture. I'm sure I missed a few, but, but I think these are many of the most important ones. Okay, then, then uh, another maybe more speculative view on the data models is, is this. Um, I noticed that there is some sort of a contrast and maybe also some, sometimes a tension between different use cases for this bibliographic RDF or linked data. And I, I I think I see there a sort of a uh, const const uh, contrast between two main use cases. The, the one on the left, I call it libraries here for the sake of just having a name for it. It's, it's uh, when you want to produce and maintain uh, data or metadata uh, natively as RDF. So that's, that's in that case, that's, that's sort of the more advanced use case where you actually want to leave mark behind and, and therefore it's important to uh, be able to losslessly convert from, from mark to, uh, to the new model. And it, in practice it usually means that you end up modeling on a, perhaps a little bit more abstract level, so you're maybe not always modeling uh, real, world, real world entities directly, but instead model abstractions such as records or um, um, things in an authority file. Um, and then you need all kind of housekeeping metadata and, and also it's important to to be in control of the whole model, so uh, reuse of other models is, is not that common. Then there's the other extreme is the web is use case when you want to publish your data for on the web so that others can make use of it. And then it's more important to be interoperable with what else has been published as, as uh, linked data, including non-library data. And, and uh, this means also that it uh, makes sense to model, uh, for example, people and organizations, places as, as real-world objects and not as records in an authority file, for example. 
and it's important to be simple, it's, it's acceptable to lose some of the detail here in the web issue use case. So we can look at these data models on, on this, this axis. So, and we can look separately at, at bibliographic data, meaning the things that normally go in a MARC bibliographic record, which are here sort of on the upper part, and then authority data, which is things that are usually represented in a MARC authority record, like people and places and concepts and organizations. So I placed some of these models here. Uh, for bibliographic data, uh, the sort of the most library-ish models here are the BibFrame family in general and RDA and also MODS RDF. All of these are, are quite detailed, uh, so they try to preserve a lot of the detail that's in, in, in RDF and they have house, things like housekeeping metadata. Uh, and they are self-contained, meaning that they don't reuse other vocabularies that much or at, at all even. Um, the, the linked data for libraries and linked data for production people with their flavors of BPREM, they're sort of pulling it in a, little, a little bit in the webbish direction by, uh, by trying to reuse some of the other data models and, and sort of cutting the, the most awkward modeling uh, decisions. Then on the webbish side there is, um, well Dublin Core is quite webbish, although it's self-contained maybe because it was came so early. And then there's Bibo and Fabio which are very webbish in that they reuse other data models, for example FOV and uh, SCOS and um, so they don't try to model everything but instead reuse other models. Schema.org is also quite webbish, even though it's self-contained, but just the, the, the basic use case of uh, being able to express almost any structured data on the web just makes it very web-friendly in a way. Uh, regarding the, the models that can only be used for authority data, FOF, of course, is good for modeling people as real-world objects, uh, perhaps also organizations. Uh, and SCOS is good for modeling uh, conceptual things, although it's often a little bit debatable whether those are real-world objects or not, but anyway. MADS RDF is uh, a model that sort of extends costs in a way that can be used uh, to represent all the detail in, in, in a MARC authority record. So it's sort of pulling SCOS more into the library direction. Okay, I think we're done with this. So, so basically this is what has happened with, with these standards. There's quite a few of these models and I'm, I'm sure I missed a few. And uh, it's basically, yeah, you can see the comic, but I think it sort of summarizes it neatly. That there's many models, but then when new people come in and, and want to do something, they realize that none of them seems to fit perfectly, so they add a new one to the mix. And, and then, yeah, then we have even more standards. So what the end result is this, that although many libraries already are experimenting with publishing linked data, uh, they sort of end up creating their own silos. It's, 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 in a way it's very open because it's linked data, it's usually open data. Um, but in practice if you want to, want to reuse and especially want to combine or con compare uh, data from different sources, they are, they, they, they are, the differences are so significant that it can be really difficult in practice to do. Okay, so why does it have to be like this? Why does everybody do, do their own thing instead of trying to agree on something common? First of all, of course, there's different use cases. Um, every library is a bit different. And um, none of the existing models is completely satisfactory for I would say any use case, but yeah. But still one would think that it would be possible to have a, a single model that could cover at least most of the ground for things like basic mark records. I don't know what, what goes into a sort of a normal national library collection if there is such a thing. So then the second reason is, is that if when you want to convert existing data into a model model, it's 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 usually quite difficult, even though there are tools available, but especially the entity-based models are, and, and Ferber in particular, are difficult because you want, you need to extract 
uh, things that are not explicitly represented in the original data. This is sometimes called favorization or just work clustering, whatever. But it's um, bib frame is a little bit easier because it has a little bit more relaxed view about works. It doesn't have expressions as a separate layer like Ferber has, but it's still difficult. So then that's also a reason why there are different solutions or or just many many libraries just avoid the, the whole thing and go with a flat model. Uh, then the third reason is if libraries want to control their data, including their data models. So um, uh, it's also a political thing, but of course there are sometimes good reasons for this. For example, localization. Uh, for example, the Japanese um, Dublin Core application profile um, has some special solutions for their for representing their titles because the, the Japanese um, writing system and you have hiragana and katakana separately and you need the both to be um, in order to avoid ambiguity and this is something that doesn't exist in the general models so they have to do their own solution a fourth reason of course is that you, once you do put a significant amount of effort into converting to some data model it's there's a lot of in inertia to, to change it later on. So, so what, whatever you start with, you end up uh, living with basically forever. So if you, if you now want to start a project for publishing your own bibliographic data as RDF and linked data, then I think these are the core questions. First of all, if you want, do you want to have works as a separate thing or is it enough to have just records? Um, and then the second thing is, is uh, whether you want to only publish it uh, for the web or whether you want to actually maintain it as RDF. Uh, for maintaining, it's not clear that whether these existing models are enough. Uh, of course, man, uh, there are some experiments going on uh, trying, to, trying to find out and also improve them, but, but, but it's still very early days. But for the publishing use case, we already have quite a lot of data models, so, so yeah. So what can we do about the situation? First of all, don't create more data models, especially only if it's for publishing. Uh, it, it, I think uh, it, from a perspective of an outsider wanting to access your data, it would be helpful if, if people would do it in even roughly in the same way instead of every library inventing their own. Um, the LDA4P project for production is, is, I think, a very good example in that they, they try to, try to uh, prototype and test the, the production and maintenance of, of library data using, based on native RDF instead of Mark records. And also one question is, is uh, whether these, uh, how to come up with solutions that would let us, uh, let different libraries share their works and other entities instead of everybody having to maintain their own. I think that's an open open question for now. Also, there's the possibility that Google or some other big player with, for example, Facebook would uh, sort this out in the way that they would create some service that would harvest all the bibliographic data that's available and, and just set the rules saying that you have to follow this model or you will be left out. Um, I, so it could be used for something like a global bibliographic knowledge base or maybe something like Wikidata or, or then just having the, getting more exposure to the search engines. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is actually going to happen, whether library data is so important for any of these big companies that they would care, but it's possible. And for example, Google quite recently defined a schema for scientific data sets, uh, which presumably they are thinking about some use for later on. So, so um, if, if the libraries themselves cannot agree on a model, it's possible that somebody else will just enforce it. And, of course, this will mean even less control than what we have today. Okay, then moving on to the second part of my webinar. So, uh, about how we are going to publish Finnish bibliographic data as linked open data. This is what we have 
are currently our main bibliographic databases. Uh, we have Fennica, which is uh, the Finnish national bibliography. Uh, it has uh, about one million records, but it's part of a, a larger union catalog called Melinda with nine million records. And then we also have separate databases for articles and music. And these are all mark-based uh, systems, either Voyager or Aleph, uh, although we are in the process of, of up, uh, moving on to a next generation library system, but it's pro most likely still going to be mark-based. Uh, we opened the, the uh, uh, sort of the <laughs> old school APIs in September 2016, so these have in a way have already been made available, but it's it's not yet really on the web. Uh, it's it's there's there are OPACs and there's the Finna discovery layer, but it's but the data itself is not very easily available. Uh, my assignment basically is to to put this on the web, uh, a little bit like the Stillbird comic. It's a little bit fuzzy, uh, but what the actual um, end result will be, but but I will try my best and and, and um, sort of the first part of this talk was, was based on my research into how best to approach this. So looking at other libraries' examples and trying to distill uh, what would be the best practice. Oops. So uh, we're not very linked to start with because, yeah, uh, uh, the data in our bibliographic databases is quite heavily siloed, unfortunately. Uh, first of all, only some of our bibliographic records are in WorldCat because they were um, uploaded a few years back uh, as a, sort of a test. And uh, unfortunately, we don't even know their uh, OCLC numbers, so we can't easily uh, link them to, to, to WorldCat. Uh, our bibliographic records aren't properly, aren't explicitly linked to the authority records, uh, although we are trying to work on it at the moment. Uh, our person and corporate name authority records, some of them are in VIAF, but we don't know their IDs either, so uh, we're sort of missing the link. Uh, and we're not in ISNI either, but the only good news here is that our subject headings, the YSA, the source, uh, they are linked to YSO, which is the more modern uh, ontology sort of alternative, and, and they are linked to the Library of Congress subject headings, so, so we're good there. But, um, and we decided to target schema.org out of those, all the, uh, all the um, models that I introduced, because it, it seems that it schema.org uh, and the bibliographic extensions, um, they can be used for surprisingly rich descriptions, uh, much richer than basic Dublin core, certainly. And it's also possible to represent works um, similar to how, how BibFrame does it, so you have a separate work, works and instances, basically, even though they're not called that way in schema. So, so you get the advantages of a, of a full data model with schema.org because you can represent so many other things as well, not just the, the, the bibliographic, sort of the core bibliographic data as well. Uh, and it forces you to think about data from a web user's point of view. So, so you're not just looking inwards at your records and you're not saying that we have these records but instead you have to put it like this, that you, you have this collection of literary, wor literary works and we have these editions available in our collection and, and then you can say that they are available free of charge for reading or borrowing from our certain building in a certain address with opening hours or then the electronic versions are available online from these URLs. So, so you can express actually quite a lot of things uh, using schema.org that are just not just primarily about the bibliographic data but also about the context where it's provided. So it's, it's, I think it's very helpful to, to have to think about it from a web point of view and a user's point of view. Here's an example of how <clears throat> this is um, how, how data would be modeled, our, our data would be modeled using schema.org. I got some help from Richard Wallace doing this. So, so this, this, this is a book uh, it's it's a translation. It's a Finnish translation of Stephen Hawking's book, uh, *The Illustrated Brief History of Time*. 
so here on the top left you see how the original English language works represented. Um, so you have the, the, the title, the language, and the, the author, basically, and then some um, subjects. Then you have on the bottom left the Finnish translation, uh, which is linked to the original. Um, and it also has the same author, but then it has the translator separately. And yeah, it's in Finnish. And, um, and then, um, then it's linked to the manifestation or instance, depending on yeah point of view. But but this is basically a specific edition of that book, uh, published in a certain year by a certain publisher and um, having a certain number of pages. So so you get this. Um, you don't uh, originally this is all just one record, um, one mark record, but. Um, but this is what we want to have. We want to represent the orig original works, the translated works, and the specific editions of those. Um, and the way we do this to get from mark to schema is actually through BibFrame, because uh, when you want to do this kind of conversion, uh, the first one of the first steps is actually to get from the mark records into some or just any kind of RDF data that makes sense, that doesn't lose any important information. And uh, for me, Mark is not a, certainly not a native language, it's, it's a foreign language, so uh, it's having some tool to, to break it up and to remodel it uh, in a more entity-based fashion is, is, is a very nice thing to have. And, and the big frame converters actually do a good job of this, so, so they can um, extract, a, extract a lot of information in, from the mark records, including all things like subfield combinations and special codes, um, and represent it as RDF. And I uh, tried a few. So, uh, Zephyr as uh, PyBib frame, I tested it briefly. Uh, unfortunately, it was a little bit slow. It's based, based on Python, uh, which is a very nice language, but doesn't perform that well. Um, and it also seemed to lose some some information, so um, uh, it didn't seem that promising. And then the Library of Congress, the mark, bib, mark to bib frame tool, that's what I ended up using for the moment. Uh, it can perform quite well if you run it the right way using a wrapper, and uh, and it seems to produce consistent RDF output, which is very rich but quite verbose. Unfortunately, it's not maintained anymore. So, um, and there's there are bugs in it, and uh, nobody's going to fix them. So, uh, it's not a long-term solution. Uh, Library of Congress is also working on a BibFrame 2 converter together with uh, basically with Index Data uh, consultant. Uh, it's not yet released. They promised that it will come out very soon. Um, I want to try it when it comes out. Uh, also, the Linked Data for Libraries Labs project is working on uh, the bib to lod converter, which is uh, converting from Mark to de their their uh, ontology, which is basically a flavor of BibFrame 2. So I'm also following this closely, and I would like to switch to uh, the, either the new bib Library of Congress BibFrame 2 converter or the the LDA for L Labs uh, converter when it comes out. Um, this is how we do the conversion. So we um, we've, we've set up a pipeline, which is basically a batch process, and using a Unix tool called Make uh, to define the, the steps of the conversion and dependencies between those steps, uh, which is nice because it gives you the opportunity to do incremental updates. So so you split the the, the whole data into batches, and then you only reprocess the, the batches that have changed. And it also allows you to do parallel execution on a, but only on a single machine. But anyway, you can make use of multiple CPUs to get more, to get better performance. And we also have unit tests. So um, the pipeline starts with a dump from the, um, basically from Melinda, the, the union catalog, uh, but it, this is the Fenica subset of, of Melinda. Uh, one million records um, in Aleph's own uh, text-based text uh, format, 
but basically mark records, and we split it into about 300 batches um, so that it can be processed in parallel. It takes a couple of minutes. Then uh, the first step is to do some filtering on these and then convert it to mark XML using Kathmandu, and also Kathmandu can do uh, can fix up things in the mark records. So a few things tweaks have to be made there to, to get optimum results from the next steps. So we get uh, a bunch of MARC XML files. And then the next step is to run these through the uh, MARC to BIP frame converter. So it takes a bit more than an hour to do. Um, and we get uh, RDF XML files basically. And, and you can see that the, the amount of data is also increasing here because it's so the, the output is quite verbose of the conversion. Then <clears throat> from there we convert to schema.org uh, and now since it's all RDF we can use Sparkle which is very nice because you can do a lot of things with Sparkle. And um, so we convert that a bit frame to schema.org. Um, and it actually reduces the data by a lot. And of course, some of the data is, is actually lost, but most of this uh, reduction is just uh, representing things in a simpler way than in the, in the um, bit frame output. Then from there, we <coughs> combine these, uh, the raw schema.org with, with other sources like uh, the subjects from YSA and organizations from our um, from our um, corporate name authority and some RDA vocabularies and we can reconcile these the, basically turn strings into things in this step so it's still uh, schema.org but makes more use of URIs after this step then in, in sort of in parallel to this we also create some work keys out of the build frame RDF output this is also done using Sparkle and, and we get a set of keys for each of these uh, works. And then based on those keys, we create mappings. So what work should be turned or merged with another work based on shared keys. And then at the end, we merge the works using this uh, work mappings. Again, using Sp we use Sparkle as a tool. And we get some raw merge data. And then the final step is to clean up this and yeah, and we use in addition to um, RDF and triple files, we also use a technology called HDT, which is a very nice com uh, compressed format for RDF, which can also be queried directly without loading it into memory. So it's useful for processing. And it's all available in GitHub and being developed there. So you can follow it if you're interested. It's I, I wouldn't say it's directly a uh, can be directly applied to other libraries data because there are some assumptions for example the since it's uh, the the Finnish cataloging um, some assumptions about the Finnish cataloging have been built in here so you can't use it directly but you can take a look and see if there's something you could reuse or just be inspired by Okay, then, then a few words about how we model uh, translated works and, and works in general. Uh, because this is, I think, an, an interesting um, uh, challenge is to be able to group records by, by work and, and also to combine all the translations of, of a single work so that they are actually uh, properly joined up in the data. So about 15% of Fenica records, meaning 150,000 records, uh, are translations. So they have um, in uh, 041 subfield H, they have the original language. And ideally all these translations should have the name of the original work in the, um, and also uh, the name of the translation translator as a contributor. Uh, in practice, not all of them have this uh, but yeah, but still uh, most of them do. Here's an example. Uh, this is also, um, this is a finished translation of uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time. This is not the exact same one because this is the original, not the illustrated, but still the same book. So yeah, we need to infer the 240 subfield L because it, it's not in the data. But 
yeah, that's done part of pre-processing. Uh, and in here we have the name of the original work, A Brief History of Time, uh, and we also have the name of the translator in the 700 fields, it's uh, Risto Varteva. Unfortunately, we don't have a code here saying that Carl Sagan was responsible for the foreword, foreword and Risto uh, Varteva for the translation, so, so it's not as rich as it could be. Okay, then <clears throat> after doing the bib frame conversion, uh, we get from for uh, original works, uh, the bib frame converter gives us uh, a single work usually and a single instance. And for translated works, we get actually two works. So one represents the original and one rep represents the translation. And uh, and you get a lot of person objects even though they are the, in many cases they will be the same person but they are represented separately. So the, the, as I said, the, the output is very verbose. There is no internal uh, reconciliation here. But any, anyway, for these works we calculate the work key, which is basically the same idea as, uh, as uh, the Ferber works, work set algorithm was um, defined by OCLC a few years back and of course many other um, organizations are also use similar ideas. But we're not extracting the work keys from directly from the mark but from the bid frame RDF using Sparkle. And for, uh, for translated works we, we actually make two work keys. So uh, one for uh, one with the, the um, translated name, translated title and one with the original title plus language because it sometimes helps then in later steps to combine, to, to, to be able to combine bind also records that have, um, are missing some data. Um, now after doing this kind of merging, uh, the result is by no means perfect. Uh, here is, uh, are some um, works by Alexis Kivi, he's one of the most famous Finnish authors, and um, um, he actually wrote 14 works, at least the ones that are here. It should be 14 works, but we get 34, and um, there are various reasons for that. And the green, the light green ones are uh, uh, are works where the things were all properly merged, but the the, the gray ones are uh, where there were problems. So, for example, with Kanervala. Here's an example where the works were not merged because there is a small difference in the spelling and currently the, our algorithm is, is too stupid to figure out that. So it should use some fuzzy matching instead of uh, strict matching. And then, uh, then in some cases you get differences in the, in the um, subheading. So, um, and then, so, that, so therefore you, you're not matching properly. Um, and then um, those translations without any link to the original work, they, they look like they were independent original works. So, uh, so um, it seems that uh, Alexis Kivi would have written uh, this one in Estonian and, and um, this one in Swedish and so on. But in, in fact, it's a translation. It just doesn't say that it's a translation. Um, and here is some translations of the Seven Brothers, which is one novel by by Kivi, and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, the red ones are are uh, cases where the the, um, the works could not be merged originally. But because there is another record, which uh, yeah, it could not be merged because the 240 field was missing. It didn't have the original title, but we were able to merge many of these using other records that had the same uh, um, same translated title but did have the 240 field as well. So uh, we were able to improve uh, the, the merging um, in some cases using, this is called the friend of a friend rule, so you're sort of linking indirectly through other records. It helps with about 10% of the records that lack 240, so not, not a big, maybe not a huge improvement, but it's, it's still an improvement. Okay, our current challenges in, in this um, are, for, uh, first of all, 
there have been many problems caused by errors and omissions in the mark records and um, that tend to break all the conversion tools or cause any other problems and we tried to fix many of those in the original records. Then uh, in some cases schema.org is not as detailed as mark so for example structured page counts cannot be represented in, in the schema that only has a number of pages property that expects an, uh, a single number. Uh, linking internally is partially uh, implemented for example subjects and organizations are working but not, not with not with people yet. We're not using the person name authority currently, but should be. And then external links, we're doing some linking to the RDA vocabularies, uh, but it would also be great to be able to link authorities to, for example, YFIS, Neo Wikidata, or the works to World Health Works. And we want to publish this as linked open data using an infrastructure or something like this. So it, it would be based on HTT files that I mentioned before, which is so uh, a nice RDF compressed format, but then we could uh, use Futsaki to serve a Sparkle endpoint directly from the files and then based on that provide a web interface and REST API. But also we could use, uh, allow the HTT files to be downloaded uh, directly and then we could have a linked data fragment server uh, provide those fragments. I mean, it's not certain that we will do all of this, but these are all possible and, and uh, worth uh, at least trying, I think. Okay, but we're not yet there. I, we're trying to do this within this year, but let's see how it goes. Thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Osma. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the uh, in the question channel, so I invite all of you to um, uh, type in your questions there. Uh, let me start with a um, uh, a question. So you focused a lot on the process of moving existing um, records into new models, and I. Um, I take it uh, that the goal is to move forward in the future on the basis um, of the new model. Um, so is the new model intended to um, um, replace the old uh, model or to live alongside the model? And if it's um, intended to replace, how would you handle um, the, would you continue to make the old um, records available in some form? Um, so, first of all, uh, we're basing our, our linked data model on schema currently and um, it's going to live alongside the old one. It, the, the primary um, maintenance will be based on, on the mark records, uh, for, I think, for a long time into the future because, um, um, yeah, there's simply not enough support from the library system vendors yet. To, to be able to maintain um, maintain uh, bibliographic metadata natively as RDF, it's it's very really early days there. Although there have been very I mean promising steps in in that direction, um, and also the schema.org model is not really something that you would exp it's it's not rich enough uh, to to sort of serve the the maintenance that that the library issue use case as I called it. So it doesn't have enough uh, enough detail for that, but I think it's a very useful thing to to expose so that uh, um, people um, or programs that want to make use of the data uh, can make sense of it, even though they don't have this library background. They don't know about the uh, details of mark records and, and so on. Okay, I've gotten several other, um, unfortunately the very first question that came in, I clicked on it, I thought I was clicking on it, but it was actually a, a little garbage can, so um, I'm afraid I lost the first question. Um, but uh, let me start with the, so please repost if you were one of the first ones to post, please uh, consider reposting. Um, the next question, does uploading MARC records to WorldCat serve as a sort of data conversion? Oh, uh, well, I, I guess it does because it will be exposed by 
uh, by OCLC. But of course, you're not in control of the process. Uh, it's it's all done by by OCLC and. Uh, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and the link data it's available there. Basically, it's embedded in the in the WorldCat uh, web pages uh, using schema.org. Uh, but if you want to, for example, query to to explore the data with something like Sparkle or or do some analysis, then I think it is going to be difficult because it's it's not really like as far as I know, you can't ask OCLC to get all the RDF data. You just you can get just single, basically single records back as, as RDF and not the whole set. That's my understanding at least. Okay. The next question here is: Do you assess the the data quality systematically before conversion? What tools do you use, and how do you assess it? Uh, well. <laughs> We do have a lot of uh, sort of data quality assessment in within Melinda because it's a union catalog uh, shared by um, dozens of libraries in Finland, and they are all sort of collaborating on on the on the maintenance. Um, I'm not personally very involved with that, but I know that they have this sort of um, analysis going on. I think it's mostly just ad hoc scripts or queries. Uh, so um, I can't, um, unfortunately, uh, tell you about any specific tools, uh, except uh, we do use the, um, what's it called? Um, I lost it now, but, but um, yeah, we use Mark Edit, but we use also the, uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, blackout. Uh, I'll tell it if I if I remember it later. Um, but yeah, it's mostly ad hoc. And uh, and then for the purposes of the conversion, uh, I I also uh, myself do an, an evaluation. Of course, when I see a problem in the conversion, I I look back at the mark records and see what if, if I can find out what the problem is and, and whether it can be improved. But it's also pretty much ad hoc. So. Not a, not a specific tool to recommend. Okay, uh, so somebody wants to um, uh, is interested to know how roughly uh, how long uh, you think it'll take to uh, make the conversion and how many people um, are working on the project. <laughs> so. Um, so how long it will take, meaning how long will it take for us to get this published? Uh, so uh, we're targeting this to get it out this year, um, but uh, of course it depends on how, um, where you put the bar, so to speak. So, um, so right now I'm, I'm, we're still sort of focused on 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 improving the quality before. Uh, being uh, ready to publish it. Um, as for the number of people, well, um, I'm the only person working on it from a, sort of a linked data perspective, but there is a, a, a team behind who are uh, maintaining those uh, systems, and uh, for example, Melinda, and, and, and helping with uh, things like uh, uh, Access to have getting access to all those databases and uh, and correcting things in the original records and uh, and of course just providing advice and and um, uh, explaining the the various practices that cataloging practices and encoding practices that have been used here. We also recently did um, an RDA conversion for our records um, in. It was mostly completed last spring, so uh, we um, uh, adopted the um, new RDA cataloging rules, but still based on based on mark records. So in that process, there was a lot of uh, quality um, uh, analysis and and, and uh, work uh, also on the sort of the the legacy records and. Um, um, 
we added some of the RDA fields into into our records and and had to do this uh, conversion for all the all the old uh, existing records as well and and, and trying to to um, systematically um, get all the RDA uh, fields um, also for those old records. So that was a big effort, and it all, I think it improved the, the quality of the of the data in general by quite a lot. So we have two related uh, questions here. One of them is, uh, do you see other possible uses for linked data by libraries beyond bibliographic description? And another one um, asks more specifically, do you think that the uh, methods for linking data can apply um, also to electronic health records? Oh, okay. That's, um, that's an interesting one. But yeah, um, I think for the first part, um, uh, I think bibliographic description is just sort of a one one type of data in a larger uh, framework and uh, or a larger sort of data ecosystem, if you want to put it that way. And uh, I would just like to see that we could provide that part, which is something that we're sort of tasked. Uh, for doing in this country and um, um, but um, so so one of the things we're we're do we're sort of planning to do with the data and already doing it is is to collaborate with uh, with uh, digital humanities researchers who have been analyzing the Fenica database for already a few years now and, and trying to spot interesting patterns especially in the in the older older material so tracking the the, the spreading of of, uh, of new ideas and, and sort of the, the uh, adaptation of, of texts um, in the in the 17th and 18th centuries for example so, so this is maybe not a very traditional use case, but it's still very much focused on bibliographic data. It's just that they, they maybe look at different parts of the data than than uh, what's usually done. So they are look very, looking very closely at the publishers and the locations of publishers and and and, uh, uh, and languages patterns in the languages, uh, for example. So, so. Yeah, this is a bit non-traditional. Uh, about healthcare records, uh, well, <laughs> that's that's a huge topic. I don't see a direct connection, except that one thing that we are also involved with is um, 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 open open science and research project, a very large project uh, where the national library. Is uh, is a partner and and um, there the challenge is to be uh, able to collect and uh, preserve and uh, expose uh, all the various scientific datasets that are being created and have been created uh, and to describe them with rich metadata and and I think there is a, an obvious connection to to bibliographic data in that. Usually, um, research uh, ends up being published in some form, is as articles or uh, books or conference papers, and it would be very interesting to capture the connection between the the sort of the the, the published uh, articles uh, and the, the data sets and and, and and sort of see the patterns, and um, and I think there is potentially a connection to to also to healthcare like to other uh, uh, domains, of course, as well. But it's, it's quite indirect, so I'm not sure if this answers your question. Okay, so um, I think we're down to the final five, five minutes here, so uh, I think we have time for about um, two more questions. Um, one of them is, um, how extensive is the data loss faced in dumbing down mark to schema.org expectations and what recommendations would you make if any to su supplement that loss? Um, well, it is, it's very difficult to quantify because uh, 
I don't know how you would do it. Uh, in Mark records, there's quite a lot of those uh, bits in the leader, for example, that flags, and uh, uh, a lot of that is maybe mostly relevant to the, to the maintenance process. So it's more like housekeeping metadata than anything you would necessarily want to expose to the public. Uh, so uh, obviously a lot of that will be will get lost in the process, but I'm not sure if that's very important if you're not if you're sort of targeting uh, not maintenance but reused for other purposes. Um, uh, so, so we are, we're sort of taking a, 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 a um, tackling this in a way field by field or, or property by property in that we uh, look at the, the final data and see whether there's something important missing and if there's something missing we try to figure out how to how to convert that as well but yeah if I say that we can convert 70 percent or 80 uh, percent I don't know what to base that kind of figure on but that's that's sort of my rough feeling that that we can get the most of it, but not by not 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 all of it. Yeah. Okay. I think um, this is the final question then. So one concern is the cultural differences between librarians and webby people. Librarians need to become comfortable with inconsistent output, and web people can tell us what we can do to help you to help us. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. But also, I think that's that's a little bit an illusion that that uh, they. I mean, the, the, what you mentioned that libraries have to be com comfortable with, uh, with um, how was it? How was it said? Inconsistent. Uh, inconsistent. inconsistent. Because yeah. from my point of view, I'm not a librarian. I'm just looking at uh, their data, and I see a lot of inconsistencies in the existing data that they have collected over the years. And uh, so I think it's been inconsistent all along. It's just that maybe it's not obvious from the from the systems they use or for the sort of the traditional use cases. So if if you're, for example, if your records are missing the the translator or missing the original title or um, yeah, that's that's important information for some use cases, but yet it's missing for many of those records. So. Um, um, yeah, but I, I think there's a potential for feedback from from sort of the more webby community here. In that, uh, when when library datasets are being linked to to external datasets, um, then you can also uh, feedback some of that to back to the libraries. For example, with the with the thesauri and ontologies, we've been doing some of this. So the YSO has been linked to the Library of Congress subject headings. Well, that's still a library. Uh, model uh, library uh, um, oriented concept scheme, but uh, but we also linked uh, some of our places to uh, the um, National Land Survey uh, registry of place names, and in doing that, we noticed that there is actually a lot of inconsistencies in the way that places have been modeled in the in the library authority files, and and we were able to enrich those those uh, records and, and correct some of the problems, the quality issues in those records, just looking at the, the um, National Land Survey data. So, so when you go out to link your data, you start to notice that actually there are things in your data that could be improved using the external data. Uh, just one point of clarification. Somebody asked what YSO is. Uh, YSO, that's the Finnish General Ontology. Uh, it's um, yeah, it's a, a concept scheme. Um, it's debatable whether it's actually an ontology. It's more like a modern thesaurus, but anyway, it's a set of about 30,000 concepts that um, is used for uh, subject description. Uh, it's um, based on the YSA, the older thesaurus, which is still being used as the main main um, concept scheme for describing uh, for subject description. But YSO is is um, going to replace that. We're in the process right now. So. Okay, thank you very much, Asma. Um, uh, apologies to uh, those of you who submitted. There were lots of questions, um, more than we had time for.
Um, if uh, Stefan is out there, uh, I think I'll hand the microphone back to him for um, for closing remarks. Thank you, Tom. To all those still here at, um, in the webinar room, this is just to let you know that the webinar was recorded and we will send out the recording via email within 48 hours of today's webinar. And Ozma will get the unanswered questions and maybe he, if he's okay with um, emailing the askers directly, that could be done. Are you okay with that, Ozma? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's so even though we couldn't get to all the questions, um, he will receive your questions and he will be able to email you directly. So um, again, the webinar will be made available to all the attendees within 48 hours of today's webinar. And that is all for today. Thank you, Ozma. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, DCMI, for hosting or for putting on this webinar. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Bye.